Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis using the Zelle app to box13 at greatdetectives.net, or you can also uh, become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of The Silent Men, our final episode. The original air date, May 28th, 1952, and the title is The Green Sedan. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. in The Silent Men. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men, transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now, here is Douglas Fairbanks. Last year, Americans were victimized for more than half a million dollars by counterfeiters. This case deals with a counterfeiting ring, one of the most cunning and daring in criminal history. In it, I play the role of Special Agent Sam Courtney, file case of the green sedan in which only the names and places are fictional. Queer, bogus, or paper is what the trade calls phony currency. A load of it had been dumped in Albany, $4,000 worth. And I'd been sent there to question some of the victims. Yes? Yeah. I'd like to talk to Mrs. Corbett. I'm Mrs. Corbett. Oh, how'd do? About that um, counterfeit money. I'm a special federal agent. I'd like to ask a few questions. Questions? What no. good are questions? Just give me back my $50 I was stuck for. Well, the local report says you accepted three of the bills. Do I get my money back? Maybe when we catch him, you can put in a claim. When you catch him? That's a laugh. Three people cash the bills? Two men and a woman. You described one of the men as having a scar on his neck. Yes. What about the girl? Would you know her again? Seventy-five people for lunch, and I'm supposed to take pictures. That money, the government ought to give it back. Oh, right, your congressman. The man with a scar, you'd recognize him? Maybe. He drove the car, I remember that. What kind of a car? Oh, green, I think. Big car, small one, two-door, four-door, what was it? I don't know about cars. All I know is I'm out fifty dollars. You don't think you could identify any of the three, do you? I told you. Look, I got work to do. Okay, okay. I may contact you again, but only if I have to. I spent another two days in Albany gathering information. Then I checked into my divisional chief in New York City. All right, Sam, come in. Uh, Chalk up another take for him, chief. Close to 5,000 in Albany, tens and twenties. This is making me look silly, Sam. I don't like looking silly. One of the pushers had a scar on his neck. Drove a green sedan, seen in four different places. The car's got a license, Sam. Did you run it down? Four people saw the car, but not one of them remembers seeing the license plate. Uh, I might have known it. Only one thing they have in common, Chief. It's a green sedan, a light green sedan. Oh, great, Sam. Wonderful. They're turning out stuff good enough to get by the average banker. They keep hopping from city to city. We're in a rut, Sam, you and me both. Thanks. We're forgetting the most important thing. Not the crime itself, but the people behind it. Okay. So we know one of them has a scar on his neck, anyway. And one of them's a woman, a good-looking girl, about 25, about 5'3 or 4. Yeah, about. Sam, go out and find me a man with a big, ugly scar on his neck. Guy that drives a green sedan. Must be quite a few around town. Hmm? Then run them down. One of them belongs to us. Medium, heavy build, scar on left side. All right, Sam, beat it. You got work to do. That is the understatement of the week. (laughs) 
I spent the next two weeks in a maze of photographs trying to find the chief's Mr. Who. I tracked down every possible lead, but got nowhere. As a last resort, I contacted one of the characters of the underworld we lightly refer to as an informant. Got a match, mister? Sure. Thanks. Seen anybody around I might know? Oh, we're all right. We're looking for a guy with a scar on his neck. What's his name? We don't know. Think he's a New York boy? Last seen in Albany. What'd you want him for? Never mind that. Might be Ed Nello or Flashy Jordan. They're marked up like that. It isn't anybody we got on record. What'd you want him for? Pushing queer. Oh, the boys have been doing so well upstate? Yeah. Know anything about him? Well, I'll get in touch with you. Well, call me as soon as you know. Any time, at night or day. Uh, how about a retainer? Say 50, huh? Let's say 25. Huh? All right, only don't let her get around that I'm cutting prices. Maybe I was getting stale. A week went by and I was no nearer to end. In the meantime, Washington sent down a half a dozen men to help out. We set up an elaborate protective system throughout the state. It wasn't functioning in time. They struck again before we were ready. Buffalo. They got Buffalo. Six thousand phony dollars reported in already. Uh, they've got a smart setup, Chief. Well, ours is smarter. I want those men, Sam. Did the green car show up? No. Neither did the man with the scar. Our big lead, and he doesn't show up. Well, he's around someplace. How about your friend, Ted? Haven't heard from him yet. Well, maybe you better get in touch with him. All right. I tried, through the usual channels, to contact Ted Manning, my source of information on matters pertaining to fringe society. But he didn't call me back. I went looking for him. It took two days, but I finally located him sitting at the bar in the Green Light Cafe. I sat down beside him. For crying out loud, what'd you come here for? I left a lot of messages for you, Ted. You didn't answer. I got nothing for you. You should have called me. You're not doing me any good sitting next to me here. Okay. Meet me outside in ten minutes. Make it fifteen. Be there. Here's a good spot to sit down. Yeah, I never even knew there was a park around here. Well, you got to look for these things. Uh, uh, that guy with the scar, I checked all around town. Ninety percent of my job is knowing when people are lying, Ted. Look, Mr. Courtney, you think I'd lie to a federal man? Who is he, Ted? Gus Manelli. Manelli? Hmm. Name's familiar. Got out of Sing Sing about seven months ago, armed robbery. Oh, I got him now, yeah, yeah. But as I recall, none of his pictures show a scar. He got cut up in a fight when he got out. Is he around town? I don't know. Are they working out of New York? Uh, it's like that kid in the beanstalk, Mr. Courtney. You start following it up, then you got an idea where it takes you, and you're back down in a hurry. And that's the way it was with this thing, huh? What I don't know, I can't talk about. Get it? All right. Just one thing. What's Manelli's part in the setup? Flonky. Errand boy. Where does he hang out when he's in town? Uh, so long, Mr. Courtney. This park air ain't good for me. With a good lead to work on, some of my self-confidence returned. I got a batch of Manelli's police photographs and had one of the art boys paint in a scar on the left side of his neck. I took him down to Albany. Two of the four people who had seen him were positive in their identification. The other two, almost so. Back in New York, I learned about the fight Manelli had been in. The guy who'd knifed him was Nick Forbes, another thug, temporarily out of prison. Well, what did I tell you, Sam? We start looking for people instead of machines and we're getting places. Now we've got two men to get, Gus Manelli and Nick Forbes. How do you figure they tie in together? Just because they're both among the missing? Uh, men fight over two things, Sam. Women and money. We find Forbes and we can eliminate one of them. You want me to call on Manelli's mother? Yes. And Sam, uh, I'm putting another man on this with you. Yeah? A younger man. 
Someone who isn't in a rut, you mean, huh? Just came in from Washington this morning. Nice kid, you'll like him. But? Who said any buts? A certain curl in your left eyebrow said it. <laughs> well, he's 22 years old and kind of excited about the whole thing, you know. A novice. Oh, no. Well, he tops the class in theory. Uh, valedictorian, class of 51, eh? Well, he's apt to be a little over-anxious about his first assignment. <laughs> you might have to kind of hold him down a little. Uh, where is he? He's out in the hall waiting for you. Al Banning was a nice kid, and like the chief said, young and eager. Walking beside him in the bright sunlight that afternoon made me feel a little old and tired. You understand, Al? We've got to find Gus Minnelli or the guy who knifed him, Nick Forbes. You've studied their pictures, know their chief characteristics, don't you? I'd know them in a minute. That's the stuff, boy. You're going to keep Forbes home covered in case he turns up. Sounds kind of... of inactive. He might not even show up. Well, it's happened that way lots of times. What about a relief man for food and such necessities? You'll improvise. The minute he shows up, call the office. If he comes out before we can get there, tail him. Do the best you can. I don't want to brag, Mr. Courtney. Call me Sam, just Sam. I topped the whole class in shadowing. Oh, yeah, yeah, the class, yeah. <laughs> I forgot the class. I want to see Gus. He's not here. You his mother? Yes. What time will he be home? He doesn't stay here anymore. Where can I reach him? I'm a friend of his. Good friend he has. To prison they lead him. Is he in New York? I don't know. He comes here no more. Now that he has a wife, he needs no one else. Gus married. I never heard that. And you friend of his? Four months they have been man and wife, and I have not yet met her. That is his son for you. What was the girl's name? Catherine MacDonald. He's ashamed to bring her to me. Maybe he's ashamed of her, Mrs. Minnelli. Thank you. Good day to you. <laughs> Like the song says, first there were none, then there was one, Gus Minnelli. Then there were two, Nick Forbes. And then there were three, Catherine MacDonald. Number three had no police record, but we found out where she had worked and some friends of hers provided us with snapshots that we converted into pictures. We sent a couple of hundred of these out to post offices and police stations in the state. One night, Al Banning, my young assistant, phoned me. Hello? Sam, I did it. Did what, kid? What's the matter? I had Forbes and I let him get away. What? He showed up at home a couple of hours ago. Why didn't you call in? He just stayed a couple of minutes and came out. He walked to the corner and hailed a cab. You lost him? I had him till he got to a place on Adelaide Street. Oh, what kind of a place? Well, he went in and I covered the front door. About 15 minutes later, I heard a car pull away around the side. It was Forbes. You're sure? Positive. Uh, he must have had the car planted there waiting for him. Al, I... I'm afraid to ask. Did you get the license number? N. Finelli, 71Y for Yale, 04. Good boy. Now phone it into motor vehicles and have them run a make on it. I did. I've got to call them back soon. Where are you now? Near the warehouse on Adelaide Street, where I lost four. What kind of a warehouse? Acme Printer Supply. Huh. Someone's still in the office. Shall I question them? No, no. Don't do anything. Just wait there for me. I didn't figure he'd leave around the side. Well, he must have picked up some paper or ink. I was stupid. I should have known. Oh, forget it, kid. The guy's still in there. Shall we go in and talk to him? No, no. We might tip him off that we're getting warm. Maybe he's on the level. We can't take any chances. Tomorrow you go in and find out if they handle triple A Pearson bond paper. The brand they're printing the money on now. He didn't show at home. I checked. All right. We got things to do. The owner of the car. They should have it by now. Come on, kid. The night's young. Only a quarter to twelve. 
Police headquarters had the information on the car ready for us when we got there. It was owned by a Mr. Blake, Andrew Blake, certified accountant. His address, 926 Ashley Drive in Long Island. It was nearly 2 a.m. when we parked the car about half a block from that number. Al was tense and nervous, like a novice should be. Footsteps sound kind of loud this time of night. Hmm. I was wondering when you were going to develop some of the neophyte symptoms. I've got them now. <laughs> Let's get around the back. We'll take a look in Mr. Blake's garage. We'll go up this lane. What if it's locked? Then we get in anyways. Place isn't locked. Put your light on. Here's the license number. N Nelly 71 Y Yale 04. Is this the car? No. I don't get it. This car hasn't been out of this garage for three months. Tires are flat. I tell you, that's the license number. I saw it. But this isn't the car, huh? No. Ugh. Maybe the plates were taken off and put back. And you see the rust on these screws? These plates have been where they are for a long, long time. I wrote it down right away. I tell you, it's the same number. Sure, sure, sure. Let's go. The big lead dissolved into minus zero. We even went so far as to check on all license numbers that had the same four markings, but it led us nowhere. I sent him back to keep an eye on Forbes' house. Two days later, the chief sent for me. Sam, I've taken Al off Forbes' house. I put someone else there instead. All right with me. He, uh... Asked me to let him follow a couple of leads of his own. You don't mind, do you? Uh, what for? It's ten years since I sulked over something like that. Yeah, the boys made some interesting discoveries. Ah. So that's what this has been leading up to, eh? He found out that the McDonald girl, Gus Manelli's wife, used to work for the accountant. What's his name? Blake? Yeah. Ah. Then he got into Blake's garage and took one of the sets of plates off and had them tested in the lab. Ah, the kid's all right at that. What did he find? Some bits of clay, the type they make molds out of. I'll be darned. He figures somebody made a cast of the license plate, eh? Huh? Yeah. Nellie could have gotten to it, I guess. Maybe the accountant himself. How'd you like to go and have a talk with him? Oh, that's Al's lead. I think he's the one to... Well, go... that's one thing he's not ready for yet. Just uh, an exploratory talk. Don't spring anything on him. No, I'll play it soft and sweet. Waltz Temple. <laughs> Mr. Blake, CPA, faced me across his desk. He was a thin, wiry, nervous little man. The uh, secretary said you were a federal agent. Yeah, that's right. Well, what do you want to see me about? You had a Catherine McDonald working for you some time ago. Hmm? Working? A light-headed, gum-chewing incompetent. Any ideas to her whereabouts? She would hardly have reason to keep in touch with me. I had to discharge her. Why? Incompetence, I told you before. You haven't seen her since? I, uh... Who says I have? Nobody, nobody. I, I just ask. Well, I haven't. Uh, was she ever at your home in Long Island? She may have been. See here, it seems that your questions are directed towards me, not her. Not at all, not at all. Well, I, I don't know where she is. What's she done? You haven't seen her since her discharge? Are you baiting me? If you have proof to the contrary, just say so. You're very jumpy, Mr. Blake. What about? Well, there's an inference in your tone I resent. And I'll say nothing further without benefit of counsel. That's very interesting. I will not be browbeaten into statements. If you persist, I'll phone my lawyer. Don't bother. It's enough to know that you feel the need of counsel. There you go, distorting, putting words in my mouth. Goodbye, Mr. Blake. Sometimes high-strung people react like Mr. Blake to any law enforcement agent. But in his case, I detected a genuine fear of being questioned. I put him down for future reference. I just settled myself for some sleep that night when the telephone rang. Hello. This is Al. Oh, who else phones this time of night? Did the chief tell you about the Acme Paper Company handling mm. AAA bond paper? Yeah, three days ago. You phoned to tell me this. Huh? Uh, not exactly. <laughs> What I really wanted to tell you was that I've just taken my date home. My pulse is racing madly for you. Uh, she's a swell looker. Okay, so you love her. Marry her and I'll present you with a waffle iron. Good night, Al. Maybe I don't make myself clear. 
This date of mine is someone extra special. I'm listening. She works for the Acme Paper Supply Company. Huh? Tonight she told me something you ought to know. Well, for crying out loud, let's have it. Forbes is due back any day now for some more paper. Good, good boy. Now, first thing tomorrow, find a spot from which you can see anyone who comes or goes out of that building. There's an empty restaurant across the street. Find out who owns it and we'll stake out there. I've already done that. Okay. You know, kid, I'm beginning to wonder. About what? You wouldn't be gunning for the chief's job, would you? <laughs> I couldn't stand to be in an office all day. <laughs> Next day, I joined Al in the empty restaurant. Everything had been removed but the smell of stale grease. Four days went by. We took turns sleeping. Always one of us was stationed at the window looking out. It was late afternoon. From the buildings nearby, workers were pouring out to try and grab that seat on the subway. I wonder what it'll be like to eat a warm meal again, Sam. Oh, it goes a lot longer than this sometimes. Eleven days I sweated it out once. It was down in... Four more days, and I'll land in Bellevue. Huh. Sam, come here. What is it? That car around the side of the building, the green one. Forbes. That's not the same car I used last time. But the license number's the same. N71Y04. Switching plates. Put them on different cars. Oh, that's an old trick. He's coming out the front door. Car's around the side, but he's coming out the front door. We'd better do something quick. He'll get away again. Hold it, hold it. He must have left a spotter on the corner to see if he's being followed. Oh, but look, she's, she's coming towards him now. You know her, Al? Take a good look. Gus Manelli's wife. She's giving him the okay sign. That's our cue. Get ready for some fancy tailing, kid. Forbes tried every known gimmick to test for a shadow. He ran signals, made unexpected left and right turns, stopped and started again suddenly. I kept up with his crazy maneuvers. I'd, <laughs> I'd been at this sort of thing longer than he had. At last, he was satisfied that he was in the clear. He headed for Brooklyn. When he got there, he stopped in front of a little Italian restaurant. We pulled up um, half a block behind them. Forbes locked the car, and he and the girl went inside the cafe. I couldn't have followed them five blocks. This comes under the heading of postgraduate work, my boy. I could sure go for some food. Uh, some other time, maybe tomorrow. Maybe we should pick them up now. Supposing we lose them. Such optimism I can do without. These people are going to lead us to the printing plant. And the plates. That's the trouble with you youngsters. Okay, Dad. Okay. Don't you dad me. I can... I can still... What's the matter? Uh, you know what, kid? We may be up most of the night. How'd, how'd it be if I caught a few winks now? Hmm? Go ahead, Dad. I'll wake you. I had hardly settled back on the car seat when Al shook me awake. The green car was hitting the road again. They picked up another man in the restaurant and he drove off with them. They parked the car in a garage on 46th Street. They got out and hailed a cab. Each of them was carrying a parcel wrapped in heavy brown shipping paper. Then the cab dropped them off at the big bus depot on 58th. And the girl went to the ticket window and bought three bus tickets. I saw them board the bus for Saratoga. And when she pulled out, we were right behind it. It was a long, grim ride. Five hours worth. About two o'clock in the morning, the bus stopped in a little town called Rosedale. We did likewise. Who'd think the bus would stop in a spot like this? Huh? Sam, huh? they're getting out. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Now, I'll go after them on foot. Car's no good now. Well, I do. Wait here? Yeah, yeah. If I wave to you, pull up. They're just standing there. I think I know why. They're waiting for someone to pick them up. Then let's take them now. No, no, sit tight. They're no good to us now. There it is. You're just going to sit here and let them get away? I told you they're no good to us now. You've got to find the plant. It's around here someplace. If you're letting them get away, I'm going to start up. Turn the ignition off. Sam! Turn it off! Come on. Where are we going? The general store. Small towns generally have the post office in one of the general stores. Ah, here it is. Yes, but... Living quarters are in the back. Oh, the guy should have heard me by now. There's a light coming on in the corner window. Yeah. What do you want? I'm not serving anyone this time of night. Open up. United States federal agents. Agents? All right. This guy will be able to tell us where we can find him. Hope you're right. Federal agents? What do you want? Let us in. 
Give us some light here, will you? Uh, there been a holdup around here? You know most everybody who lives around here, don't you? Yeah, this time of the year, I do. Summer season hasn't started yet. We're looking for a Gus Manelli. Manelli, Manelli. No such name in this district. How about Forbes? Nick Forbes. Oh, that's another one I never heard. Look, maybe you'll recognize him by these pictures. The one with a scar here is Manelli. No, never seen him. Uh, that's Forbes. Him neither. Oh, this woman, I know her. That's Mrs. Tetley. Comes in often. Good, good. Yeah, she and her husband took over the old Barrett farm. Pretty badly run down place it was. You time. sure this is her? No, oh, pretty as a picture. Sure, I know her. Where is the Barrett place? Oh, it's way up on the hill. Tough spot to get to while it's dark, though. You have to know these parts. You know these parts? None better. All right, get some clothes on. You'll take us there. <laughs> He was a reluctant guide, but a good one. In half an hour, we were sneaking up a dirt road in the hill above the town. Near a clump of bushes, he told Al to stop the car. Uh, that, that's where Mrs. Tedley lives, down the hill through this brush. It's kind of chilly. Man, yeah, two hours before sunup, gets cold up here. Some steep drops around here, better not move around before daylight. Uh, you better go back now. We'll pick up the car later. Anything you say, but... It's a long walk back to town. Daylight broke cold and frosty, and we started inching our way down the hill. It was a tough trip for a guy who'd been spending too much time in the cities. By 8 o'clock, we were close enough to get a good view of the farmhouse. I never knew a guy could be so cold and still be alive. Someone's coming out the front door now. I think it's Forbes. It is. Another couple behind him. Well, lots of company. There's our girl, Mrs. Manelli. This is it, Sam? I think so. It, it's a little exciting. My first, you know. Instead of a chill, you got a fever now, eh? Uh-huh. They're going into another building around the side. Let's work our way down. That'll bring us in pretty close. Yeah. Well, we'll be all right. They think they've got the world by the tail. We thought <laughs> they perfected it. Yeah, they all do. Stop. we better. We're almost on top of them. Listen from that window. A printing press. Oh, brother, that's music to a weary agent's ears. John, here comes Mrs. Manelli with a tub. Ready to hang out our wash. Real domestic-like. <laughs> Let's move in a bit. Oh, they never told us it'd be like this. Oh, sometimes it's like this, sometimes it isn't. That stuff she's hanging out on the line. It's not closed. Sam, look. Uncut counterfeit currency. She's hanging it out to dry. Yeah. I wonder who's behind this operation. Behind it? You see them in front of your eyes. You kidding? These guys are workhorses. The guy who does the thinking is just getting into some office in some swanky building right now. We're just going to stand here? No, no. One of us is going back to town and call the chief and bring in a raiding party. Oh, my pulse speed. If a doctor were to take it now, he'd give me oxygen or something. Should simmer down on your way back to town, Sonny. Okay, get moving. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The smashing of the counterfeit ring in the case of the green sedan closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving diamonds, orchids, and murder in the file case entitled Flowers for Madame, another venture undertaken for our protection by the silent men. <laughs> The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. The Case of the Green Sedan was written by Lewis and Russoff and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in our cast were Charles Smith, Paul Fries, Virginia Gregg, Eddie Fields, and Dal McKinnon. Your announcer is Don Stanton. Douglas Fairbanks is currently to be seen in his own motion picture production of Mr. Drake's Duck. Listen again next week and every week for other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men.
follow the campaign of the next president on NBC. Welcome back. Well, an interesting episode in that it left the mastermind of the case unnamed. And it's a different approach than many other programs. I think of Dragnet, which would often, you know, as one of, one of the things it compromised on realism, in addition to Joe Friday and his partner changing departments every week, is that uh, they would often take the experiences of two or three officers on a case, uh, you know, or teams of officers, and combine it to Friday and his partner, so that the audience could follow the full narrative, even if the initial detectives who took the case uh, in real life didn't actually uh, close it. Here they just say, you know, realistically, this is where these guys' investigation ended. And I don't think either approach is uh, necessarily wrong. Dragnet, I, I think, is a little bit less realistic, but it can be a bit more entertaining. The dynamic of the uh, young agent wasn't groundbreaking, but it was fairly well done. The end part where uh, our hero goes ahead and sends him back to, uh, to town to uh, call for the raid shows you know some of the privileges of age, which means that if you've got seniority, you're going to send the young guy back, so you better keep your legs and body in tip-top shape because your older uh, colleagues We'll make sure that you use them. Also, our hero felt very differently about being called dad than the gentleman in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. But I think that's understandable since our hero did not feel like uh, being a dad to these young agents. I don't think he was quite old enough to appreciate it. Overall, I really enjoyed The Silent Men as a series. It was a very solid anthology that told a wide variety of different tales of uh, federal agents. Now, while some of these aren't uh, as underrepresented as uh, Fairbanks seemed to indicate in the monologue, or at least they aren't today, uh, it really does provide an interesting look at the times and the, the, the type of cases that different departments had to deal with. So it's very fun, uh, very educational, and uh, some really solid stories. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Now we turn to listener comments and feedback, and we got a tweet regarding our, the uh, Sherlock Holmes episode we played. Laurel uh, writes over on Twitter, Twitter, Fellow Benchy here just finished 56 hours of Stephen Fry reading the complete Sherlock Holmes on Audible. Uh, never enough Holmes and Watson. Well, thanks so much, Laurel. And I've uh, I've seen that particular audiobook uh, for sale. And with one, at one credit, that is a really good deal for that much audio. But it's also a big commitment. So I've not uh, actually bought it yet. But I did... Uh, get Stephen Fry reading The Tales of Max Carados. So I probably should bite the bullet at some point. Uh, thanks so much for the recommendation. And for those who are outside Boise, uh, Banshee refers to uh, the area of uh, the city of Boise that uh, we both live in, the Boise Bench, a very uh, interesting section of town. All right, well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Michelle, Patreon supporter since May of uh, this year, currently supporting us at the Seamus level of $4 or more per month. Again, thank you so much for your support. Join us back here tomorrow. We'll have an episode of Public Domain Video Theater, and we'll also have our first listener support special. And then we'll be back Monday with an episode of Casey Crime Photographer. And then uh, next Saturday, join us for Top Secrets of the FBI. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. 
from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.